Before we get started, I just want to thank again Dave Curry and all the volunteers who made the food happen for this event and Hole in the Wall for providing it. So thank you. Lunch is the perfect lead into the next topic of this, the topic of this next plenary, food. Now for each of you, this word likely conjures up different images, associations, and emotions. Food is the source of sustenance and life for all. There is no doubt that ev every individual must eat food. And there's no doubt that the way that food is grown, harvested, packaged, distributed, and consumed has an impact on the economic, social, and environmental well-being of our community and the world as a whole. We've seen the symptoms of a food system gone wrong. I'm just going to list a few of them. There are plenty we could list. But for example, deforestation, soil degradation, bacterial contaminations of all kinds of foods, from spinach to hamburger meat, the rising obesity rates amongst adults and children, the growth of food insecurity and hunger in our nation and abroad, the loss of small farms, the growth of centralized and industrialized food production. These are all the symptoms of a food system gone wrong. Now we can paint a dismal picture of our current food system, but we're not here today just to dwell on the problems. We're here to think, learn, and discuss solutions to these problems. There are currently many people in our community, throughout the nation, internationally, who are working to create a regionally appropriately scaled sustainable food system that supports a vital economy, con connects consumers with producers, protects our natural resources, and provides a healthy source of sustenance for all. In this plenary, we're going to hear from community leaders that bring a variety of backgrounds and perspectives to this plenary. They're going to discuss the current state of our food system and their vision for how we can create a more environmentally responsible, economically viable, and socially just food system for all. One of the things I hope you'll take away from this plenary is this, that the problems we're seeing with our unsustainable food system have some common causes, and in turn, those problems also have some common solutions. This is why I've invited a policymaker, farmer, food bank representative, and farm to school advocate to speak on this plenary. We have common goals and will be better served by collaborating together to work toward our common goals. So with, with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists today and to moderate this plenary. I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself right off the bat. My name's Amelia Ladoche. I'm the Sustainable Development Planner for the City of Binghamton. And this topic is particularly close to my own heart. I grew up on a small farm in central New York, and I've been passionate about food all of my life. Um, to begin with, uh, to introduce our panel, I'd like to introduce Assemblyman Clifford Crouch. He served as the representative of the 107th Assembly District since November of 95. As a graduate of Unadilla High School in 63, Assemblyman Crouch went on to Cornell University and graduated in 65 when the, with an Associate of Applied Science degree in dairy science. He was the owner and operator of a 350-acre, 180 head dairy farm from 67 to 89. And uh, the Assemblyman's Assembly uh, Committees include Ways and Means, Rules, Economic Development, Job Creation, Commerce and Industry, Labor, and he's the ranking minority member on the Agriculture Committee in the, in the Assembly. In 2003, Assemblyman Crouch was appointed Chairman of the Assembly Minority Agricultural Task Force on the State of Agriculture. Next we have Lisa Bloodnick, who owns and operates the Bloodnick Family Farm in Appalachian with her husband, Brendan Bloodnick, and we have two of her very lovely children in the audience today joining us. Um, they started their farm 17 years ago on less than an acre of land and now cultivate four acres of mixed vegetables using organic production methods. They, mar they market their produce primarily through the Vestal Farmers Market and a 75-member CSA project. Next on our panel, we have Casey Telfer, who joined the Food Bank of the Southern Tier in August of 2008 as the Director of Programs and Agency Services. Casey earned a master's degree in social work from the University of Alaska Anchorage, 
Prior to joining the food bank, she served in various roles with a variety of organizations, including the American Red Cross, the Mental Health Association of the Southern Tier, and the Mary Magdalene Home in Alaska. And last but certainly not least, we have Ray Denniston, who's the Special Project Coordinator for Food Services at BOCES. Ray recently retired from his position as the Food Service Manager for the Johnson City School District. Jay was at Johnson City since 1992 and was previously the food service director at Susquehanna Valley Central School District for eight years. Um, and he didn't put this in his bio, but a lot of people here might already know Ray because of his efforts with Farm to School, and he has brought a tremendous amount of local produce into the Johnson City School District, which is a, an, a, an amazing feat. Um, a little bit more about Ray. He currently serves as the co-chair of the New York State Farm to School Coordinator Committee and is a representative on the New York State Food Policy Council. In March of 2008, Ray was one of five individuals in the nation to receive the Community Hero Award from the Centers for Disease Control's Steps for a Healthy U.S. program. Now with that, I'd like to turn over the podium to Assemblyman Crouch. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. It's a pleasure to be here today, but I first uh, I want to apologize. <clears throat> I kind of started off with a uh, uh, sinus infection a couple days ago, and it's uh, pretty well full blown into a, a good cold. And this morning when I got up, I didn't even know if I was going to be able to talk today. So the fact that I'm here is uh, a little bit remarkable somewhat now, but uh, I feel much better than I did this morning, although I may not sound a lot better. But uh, I feel very strongly about this conference and, and very pleased that I was able to take part in it. Uh, we've talked about sustainable agricultural issues in, in uh, Albany for a number of times now. Um, some of them, you know, with, with good support and some of them with some questions. But I think in general, uh, we have a, a, a uh, bipartisan, obviously, uh, committee in the agriculture, uh, in the assembly, uh, agriculture committee in the assembly and one thing that amazes me is the commitment to agriculture that everybody on that committee has. There's 22 or 23 members, and basically uh, uh, a number of them are from New York City. And when they get put on the committee, they, they uh, really sit down and ask a lot of questions about, you know, what's this, what's this mean or whatever. They are truly interested in the safe food supply and having agriculture uh, survive in New York State. <clears throat> but, you know, we, we have issues that we discuss and so forth, and, and now, even more than ever, consumer wants to know that uh, they can rely on with confidence uh, the presumption that the food that they, are, that they purchase is safe to eat. And that's certainly been a question sometimes when you see what's been happening uh, with stuff from other countries, but even in our own uh, United States from California. Uh, on the other side of the equation, producers want to know that they not only have a level playing field in the marketplace, but there's a concerted effort to expand the sale of locally grown products in one way that we can help struggling farmers and expand the local agricultural, uh, agricultural and state economy is to take advantage of the state's proximity to a huge population base, and that's the New York City area. Uh, by establishing a workable framework, uh, utilizing the expertise of our agricultural university and colleges, which brings consumers and producers and government together to explore ways in which we can improve our existing food production and delivery systems and expand capacity and in particular address the critical nutritional needs of children and low-income New Yorkers. And as a legislator, uh, we have a responsibility to make sure our food is safe, adequate, and sustainable, not only for our economy but for the health and safety of our population, obviously. As the ranking member of the Assembly's Agriculture Committee, I have had an opportunity to facilitate the discussions on issues such as sustainable agriculture and be instrumental in advancing ideas and programs, which not only benefit producers but also meet the needs and wishes of the consumers. It's imperative that we support the research done at our colleges and universities to promote no-till or low-till practices in planting our crops. Cornell University and other institutions have provided us with ways to reduce and eliminate our dependence on pesticides and herbicides. And they are constantly researching other ways and techniques in growing, processing, and packaging uh, that ultimately reduce energy consumption and, in general, make a better product. Uh, and obviously, keeping our costs down, uh, keeping our food products safe, affordable, and a better environment for us to live in. 
As you know, the legislature, in conjunction with the governor, uh, plays a key role in establishing public policy. In 2008, the Assembly Agriculture Committee tackled a, a myriad of issues, and food safety was one of the areas that received the attention of the committee. And one issue that not too many people would think about, it's not all about uh, producing the food uh, on the farm and, and just getting it to the, to the consumer in the best way possible. It's basically the, the safety of how it's handled, the processing problems, and so forth. But one of the issues was uh, the committee dealt with was a slaughter of non-ambulatory animals. And that's an issue that gained national attention as animal rights groups provided the media with documentation of livestock uh, in another state. Uh, that was basically being forced into slaughterhouses even though they were unable to, to stand on their own. As, as a result, greater attention was given to the quality and safety of meat products generated uh, from such animals. The Assembly, Assembly Agriculture Committee responded by advancing legislation to create a task force on the slaughter of non-ambulatory animals. The task force is charged with identifying the public health and safety risk uh, associated with meat derived from non-ambulatory animals. In addition, legislation was approved which requires slaughterhouses, sanitary inspections to be posted uh, for public review. <coughs> Excuse me. Marketing assistance for farmers in general is recognized as a significant issue in the legislature. The ability of farmers to successfully compete and market their products in the most important post-production issues for producers this year, the Assembly passed legislation which would provide funding for green markets. The measure requires Urban Development Corporation, or UDC, to establish and implement a regionally based urban green market facilities construction program. I was very pleased to see this come forward, and, and, but this, this program will offer construction grants, uh, revolving loans, and loan guarantees for the establishment, expansion, and development of green market facilities. It also includes green markets within the definition of a farmer's market to qualify green market projects for urban mar green market facilities construction program. A number of legislative proposals have been submitted that would enhance the ability of local schools and other institutions to buy locally produced products. Currently, our state bidding regulations are inhibitive in supporting uh, local farms due to the requirement of lowest responsible bidder. And we have been able to provide a small window of opportunity for a limited dollar amount to be spent without bidding, thus giving the schools the opportunity to buy a limited amount of food from local producers. However, if we were to look at the least cost concept where credit could be given for local producer, for a local producer paying taxes into the local school district to help offset any additional amount that the local bid might be over the lowest bid, presently there is no recognition that a local producer is paying taxes into the district to help purchase a product. The high taxes in the area might be the reason his price is higher than the bid from the supplier out of the region. And when you think about that, he's already paying his dues, he's paying his taxes, but yet if he's just a few cents higher on whatever unit is he's bidding to supply the food, if he could get be given credit for the five or eight or ten thousand dollars he's already paid into the school, that would have the, uh, the effect of lowering his bid possibly being the lowest responsible bidder at that point in time. Farmland preservation is another policy issue that is very important to leveraging our future sustainability. Urban growth has put tremendous development pressure on prime agricultural land, and during the mid-90s, the United States lost productive farmland at the rate of two acres per minute. That's an astounding rate, and I, I couldn't find any numbers to tell whether it had tailed off since then. Some of these programs have started uh, you know, since obviously the late 90s, but uh, we're very concerned about the rate that we lose productive farmland. And once farmland is covered with housing or commercial buildings, the chance of it being ever put it back into food production is slim to none. Long Island has led the way to farmland preservation with an active program, which includes some state assistance along with the ability to levy a mortgage transfer tax to develop local funds for the purchase of development rights from local farmers. Uh, this is very important. Uh, and if you've ever been out to eastern Long Island, they are struggling to preserve 30,000 acres of productive land out there. And they feel once they get below 20,000 acres, uh, they'll start losing their infrastructure. The uh, fuel suppliers, the uh, equipment suppliers will all start leaving because there's not enough mass there that they can uh, sustain their own businesses. 
and that's very critical. So Long Island, Riverhead Long Island actually has uh, been the lead uh, town on this by requesting state legislation for a uh, mortgage transfer tax. Legislation had to be passed to allow the tax, and now other communities are beginning to consider uh, similar legislation to allow a source of revenue uh, for their own farmland protection programs. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Statewide legislation has been proposed that would allow the imposition by local option of a real uh, property transfer tax up to 2% of the value of property over $150,000. The Realtors Association opposes a statewide bill because it is seen as a deterrent to selling property by placing an extra cost at the time of closing. But keep in mind, if it's passed, it's going to be a local option, so Broome County could decide whether or not they want to uh, implement that real estate transfer tax. And it doesn't have to be 2%, it could be 1%, it's up to 2%. And on, on another issue, I have uh, introduced legislation that would designate the control of aquaculture <coughs> uh, or fish farming for food to the Department of Agriculture and Markets and also allow the sale of live trout or bass. Right now, uh, it's all controlled by uh, the New York, New York State Department of uh, Environmental Conservation and they specifically <coughs> prohibit the sale of any live trout or bass. I believe this legislation would provide opportunities of aquaculture enterprises that would be consistent with the goals of sustainable agriculture, the production of food close to the market. It would provide opportunities to use land not suitable for crop production that might have the resources of adequate water to become productive in providing a different food crop. Moving the control of aquaculture to the Department of Agriculture and Markets might seem drastic, but the concept is not without precedent. precedent excuse me. <coughs> Currently, New York State DEC regulates the wild deer population as well as prohibits the sale of venison from wild deer. There are currently over 700 deer and elk farms uh, across the state for the purpose of the commercial sale of venison to restaurants and other outlets. These farms are controlled by the Department of Agriculture and Markets. In drawing a parallel, the control of sport and commercial fishing, fishing in our lakes and streams should remain under the control of DEC, while the control of fish raised for food under approved fish farming practices should be under the control of agriculture and markets. This change in control would provide the same regulations for food safety and disease control currently in place as well as a promotional component not available under DEC uh, regulations. Agriculture and markets provide food safety and disease control of all food products produced, processed, and marketed in New York State and food products grown and processed in the state are eligible to be included in in the highly successful Pride of New York promotional program. This program has worked <coughs> excuse me, to increase opportunities for New York products uh, in the New York City market as well as nationally and internationally. Current New York State DEC regulations hinder the ability to satisfy market demands in the city. There are well over one million Asians in New York City who traditionally prefer to buy their fish live and have also expressed their desire to purchase, purchase trout or bass. DEC restricts the sale of live fish for food, especially in the case of trout or bass, two very popular species for purpose of uh, con consumption, and thus we are not able to serve this Asian market. New York State DEC is also charged with regulatory control of shellfish farming off the shore of Long Island. Uh, their regulations often are not consistent with the regulations governing the shellfish farmers across Long Island Sound farming in Connecticut waters, and the Long Island fish farmers are operating under more stringent harvest regulations they are in direct competition with the Connecticut fish farmers from the New York City market. <coughs> in another example of policy change to enhance uh, sustainable agriculture in 2008, a measure was approved which provides for direct marketing assistance for fermented agricultural products and defines New York labeled liquor as being from agricultural products of which at least 75% was grown and or produced uh, in the state of New York. In addition, marketing assistance for apple and cuisine trails and effect, an effective way to prov promote New York agricultural products within the state was improved through expansion of the definition of a cuisine trail to include an association of producers that may include a combination of producers, food, and agricultural product processors and retailers that are in close proximity to each other. This measure authorized the Department of Agriculture and Markets 
to establish up to 10 apple trails and 10 cuisine trails and requires that the department consult with New York State Farmers Direct Marketing Association uh, in designating trails. It's important for the local community to be involved in supporting and developing a sustainable agricultural system. I talked earlier about farmland protection. I think it's vitally important for communities to recognize the farmland assets and develop strategies to preserve them. And active involvement in farmland preservation is necessary for, for preserving the character and the economy of our communities and having the ability for consumers to purchase fresh, safe, and nutritious food locally produced is a plus for any community. It is important to mention that preserving farmland cannot be viewed by itself as a sole element to a successful plan. We have to preserve a farmer to operate that farmland. In other words, the farmer has to be profitable in order to survive. He or she needs to be supported by shop, local programs, and promotions, and have cooperation from local government entities in regard to local regulations that may add unreasonable cost. Linking food producers with consumers in a community is a key to a sustainable community food system. And some communities utilize local food trading networks to link local businesses, which can in include farmers, packers, and processors, storage and distribution and retail businesses. Local food business ownership can also drive lo the local economy. And each local business uh, that brings in revenue and income for the owners and employees can increase regional income jobs through a multiplier effect. Uh, local county chambers need to recognize the value of agricultural base in the community and include farmers and in programs to enhance the opportunities to buy local. Often farmers feel left out of the business community, which uh, are developed to encourage other retail and manufacturing enterprises, but chambers of commerce could partner with other organizations to promote community and school gardens, thus raising awareness of the quality and safety of our local produce. Communities need to think out of the box in developing ways to sustain, uh, support sustainable agriculture. And just the other day, uh, on the, the news was a story about a city that implemented a food recycling program within the, uh, with the restaurants and any food establishment within the city. They were asked to throw their food scraps within a, a, a green container and keep separate, which was picked up separately, and it was taken to a compost facility. Uh, local farmers are now paying $400 per truckload to get that composted uh, material back, and it showed where it definitely was a soil enhancer and fertilizer for the crops that they were producing. Uh, really was a tremendous boon for their, for their crops, and it's a way of just keeping it out of the landfill. Uh, it's a win-win situation. Crops are better, the farmers get better soil, and, and the food is directed out of the, uh, out of the stream and, and reutilized back in the, in the, the uh, production of food. I'm going to wrap up very quickly. Uh, basically, I believe uh, that New York is a very good position to play a leading role in development and enhancement of uh, sustainable agriculture. We have a, a great state. It's uh, a lot of uh, related industries and integral components uh, to support the overall economic health, contributing over $3.5 billion annually to the state's economy. About 25 percent of the state's land area is used in agricultural production by 34,200 farms to produce a diverse array of farm products. That includes about 6,000 dairy farms. Uh, the state's dairy industry accounts for about 50% of the state's agricultural products. But all in all, we have also about 2 million acres of fallow land that while not commercially viable for food production, could play a significant role in producing renewable energy products. I thank you for your indulgence today and apologize for my, my voice, but uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming and let me just get this adjusted. When we started farming almost 17 years ago, I never dreamed a day like this would come when there was a whole conference in Binghamton, especially a two-day conference uh, dedicated to sustainability issues and this is just absolutely fabulous. So I really thank everybody for their interest and uh, you know, time and patience today to, you know, I know it's a beautiful spring day outside and you know, <laughs> most people, uh, I know I should probably be gardening instead of talking, but here I am. Um, anyway, my husband and I farm about four acres of mixed vegetables, and it's all that guy's fault over there, the guy with the beard with the green vest. <laughs> uh, Dick Andrus was my professor 20-some years ago, probably, and I took a class ecological agriculture with him at, at SUNY Binghamton. and. Uh, there it began. So we toured a farm, uh, Mike Kane of Shamrock Hill Farm, 
and he did something called a community supported agriculture program which was the first I'd ever been introduced to the the you know possibilities there and uh, I thought you know that's really neat that's something special and what that is all about is making connections between the consumers and producers you know the farmers and the people actually eating the food so as we uh, finished up our degrees and wondered what to do with the rest of our lives, we started putting in a small garden to uh, you know, spend some time before entering graduate school. And just there we stayed. You know, We never <laughs> did pursue the degrees after that. And uh, we started doing the Vestal Farmers Market. And Maria, who's right in the back walking, she just sat down quick. She was our original customer. <laughs> so I'm so happy she's here today. And she used to come to our stand, and we had probably less than a quarter acre at the time. And she would come and look at the card table we had out and say, well, I'll take it. And we'd say, take what? She's like, everything. <laughs> and she would. She would buy every single item on our table and take it home. And uh, she you know, is still a faithful and loyal customer. And that's what our business is all about. Is, and that's what makes a sustainable community, is making these personal connections you know, with each other, and um, you know, it's become our pretty much our entire social interactions are based also on our livelihood, and it's a nice little world that we live in <laughs> that uh, our customers are our friends now. Um, I did do a slight little, you know, I don't know if everybody can see, you know, I don't know if people over there can see the uh, slides so well, but um, just to keep myself on topic, I did come up with a couple. Um, you know, people like to see <laughs> where we are at. And one of the specialties we do is lettuce. And I grow about 60 different varieties every season. Over the course of the years, I've grown probably over 300 varieties. And everywhere I go, I'm known as the lettuce lady. <coughs> people may not always remember my name, but hey, that's my lettuce lady. And you know, refer to me as their farmer. And when you do um, this kind of direct marketing and retail sales, you know, we come to know of our, all of our customers, many of them by name. We get to know what they like, you know, their particular preferences. And, uh, you know, I know who likes the red sales lettuce and I know who likes the butter crunch. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, farming with these people, it's basically, you know, it's a very personal relationship putting, you know, food on people's tables. It's a very intimate connection. And uh, so I'd like to show some pictures, because actually I see a, a bunch of my uh, people, <laughs> as I call them, are in the audience. And here's our stand at the Vestal Farmer's Market. And lettuce customers. Uh, so I want to talk for a moment about CSA Agriculture. It's Community Supported Agriculture Program. And for every CSA farmer there is out in the world, um, there is their own way of doing it. You know, I only know how I do things, but for everybody has their own unique way. But the basic premise is the same. It's a group of customers or consumers making a connection with a farmer. And typically, you, pay, you prepay up front. I've already taken in my checks for the season. Um, I do about, I cap it at 75 families. And I have about uh, probably, way more than that on a waiting list trying to get in. Um, you know, so it's a very popular concept. We've done it for 15 out of the 17 years we've farmed. And the way it works is that they become a shareholder in the garden. They have a personal stake in the garden. And it's a nice, it's good for the farmer because we get to capitalize the farm. Our upfront expenses all occur in the spring when typical cash flow on a market garden is non-existent. You know, but right now, I'm buying all my seeds, all my inputs, you know, all my equipment costs are occurring right now. And if I was a traditional market gardener, I'm not receiving income till really July is when money starts flowing again. Typically, I'd make money July, August, September. So CSA farm, by us receiving half of our money up front, it allows us to kind of stretch out, you know, balance the budget a little bit more easily. The consumer benefits by receiving access to fresh, organically grown produce, grown by people who care, about them and what they're eating. Um, and our season typically lasts for about 20 weeks or so. We start in late May, we run into October. You know, it's weather dependent. And the individual is not guaranteed any specific item. You know, we just guarantee that we'll work hard in good, in good faith to provide you with a diverse offering of produce. We don't like give you, 
you know, tons of parsnips one week and nothing else. <laughs> we, you know, it's usually a good selection of anywhere from eight to ten different things each week. Especially after spring, it starts out typically greens and then it segues into the rest of the stuff. Um, and it's my selection, what you receive. I put it up on a blackboard and, you know, the people just come with their bags, hopefully, and follow the list. Um, we only do half of it to the CSA because it doesn't work for everybody. It is a lot of food for, you know, certain people, especially people who aren't eating, you know, cooking at home every night. So we also like doing our farmer's market. Our farmer's market people are also just as loyal to us as our CSA people. The CSA is a positive alternative to your corporate industrial agriculture system. And it's, it's spreading across the nation. Almost anywhere you go, there are people around. Some of the, I just want to point out some of the problems that we as small farmers are facing now. One of the things right now that is put up in the House, I think, in February is H.R. 875, Food Safety Modernization Act. And um, this is a barrier to the small farm. And what it is is basically one size fits all regulation. And Clifford, you know, had some, you know, made some very excellent points about the food safety, which is a huge concern and topic. But this is not the answer to have one size fits all. Um, it applies to everyone engaged in food production and opens property and records to federal inspection. Failure to comply and register is a million dollar fine per violation, which. <laughs> Obviously, I don't have a million dollars in my back pocket. <laughs> um, and it applies to everybody, you know, farmers markets, CSAs, roadside stands, as well as, you know, Dole and Kraft and all the big guys. So, um, you know, there's an issue that we are watching, as well as the NAIS, which is the National Animal Identification System, where they want every animal on a farm to be microchipped. Um, so it's easily tracked through the food system. Uh, but it's really not so much about food safety per se, it's about meeting global standards for trade. It has nothing to do with preventing disease outbreaks, which most of the foodborne illnesses occur in the processing phase of, um, rather than the farm, you know, being raised on the farm phase. Uh, and it puts an unfair burden on the small farm in terms of expense and time. Not only would I have to have a microchipping tool and chips for every chicken, sheep, you know, horse, everything on the farm. Uh, one of the other parts is uh, you also have to have the reader and you also have to notify the government within 24 hours of the animal leaving the farm, which, believe me, as a small farmer, you know, sometimes if an animal dies, the last thing you're thinking about is calling up the government and telling them that, hey, but guess what, my chicken croaked last night, you know? Um, but the, uh, and it's true because I actually have a friend of ours, Alan Chase, and he lives right down the road from us. And his cousin is a sheep, was a sheep farmer out in Wyoming. And he grazed on federal lands and he was subject to the federal, you know, rules that, uh, you know, he signed a contract, but he was doing fence lines and a tree fell on him and killed him. And his widow did not notify within 48 hours of a death on federal property and she was fined $10,000. And she, she fought back and she lost. She had to pay the fine. And I mean, when you know, she lost her husband, the last thing she's thinking about is calling up whoever she had to to notify of the death on federal property. So believe me, they do not think of you know, people's lives and the reality of what you're dealing with. Uh, Amelia asked me to mention some of my challenges as a producer, which is always labor, labor, and labor. Marketing in our area, which I'm going to talk about under strengths of our area, marketing in our area has been incredibly easy. Um, some ways we address our problem of labor is we run an internship through Binghamton University where people can receive up to four credits in an independent study for working uh, for us and keeping a journal about their experiences on the farm. This is one of our ways of reaching back to the community and by helping to train you know, interested people in how to grow their own food. Um, we have a lot of volunteers, especially through our CSA, but also just interested people that meet us at the market, like to come out and help us wash carrots, right Dave? <laughs> Lots of carrot washing involved. Um, ways to gap, reduce the gap between consumers and producers. CSA, for the people that it works for, unfortunately, just so you're not all bugging me afterwards, is that I am one of the only CSAs in the area, <laughs> very sad but true. Um, there are a couple that I heard might recently be starting, but I'm not familiar with them. I know I'm the only one that's been established, um, and we aren't accepting, we're not able to accept any new people at this point. 
But farmers markets is something you can all do, and that's one of the best things about our area is the uh, huge support um, in the development of local farmers markets. When we first started 17 years ago, there were you know very small and very few markets. Uh, Endicott at that time was the biggest market because of IBM, but as IBM declined, so did Washington Avenue, so did the farmers market. Um, right now, I run the Vestal Farmers Market, and it's our areas right now, from what I, I don't ever go to any of the others, but I hear it's one of the better ones. And, um, but that's something that everybody can do, you know, is to shop from your local farmers markets, and also the buy local movement in general has, uh, Tom Libis ran a great campaign last year, it was very active um, promoting the buy local, um, especially from you know, your local farms, and that's something everybody can do. Organic. Um, what, this is a huge, I mean, I could talk forever just on this <laughs> topic. What does organic mean? Um, in, in a nutshell, in like a one sentence answer, organic is, you know, which I, can, I don't even know if I can put it in one sentence, but, um, you know, growing our produce without the means of any synthetic chemicals or fertilizers and relying on natural inputs and working within sustainable systems. Um, and it's extremely diverse and it's based on diversity. It's not a monocrop of one specific you know, type like a field of corn. You know, usually your organic farm is going to be very diverse. I'm going to show you a couple pictures of ours in a second. Um, and alternatives, um, problem with the regulatory system now is, I was certified organic for 10 years, and uh, once the government took over, I think one of the problems is that the uh, typical small farmer is kind of contrary anyway. And uh, once the government got involved, we dropped out, and so did many, many, many of the people who've been you know, building the certified organic, especially the NOFA people. A lot of the longtime people did change. There is a whole slew of new alternative um, kind of uh, voluntary programs that people have been joining, the Safe Farmers Pledge, that kind of thing. But really, my best advice to you is get to know your local farmer. Ask them questions, talk to us, and we will, you know, share with you how we do things. Um, uh, a couple other little strengths of our areas besides the great support we've received in the local farmers markets, and I should also mention the community gardens are springing up everywhere, right Dick? Is uh, the farmers market nutrition program has been a great um, program in some respects for uh, connecting the local farmers and pe senior citizens and people who uh, receive WIC, the Women, Infants and Children's um, program, they can receive up to $20 of coupons, that, like basically $2 checks that they can redeem. It's only good for your farmer's market. So it's benefiting your lower income populations as well as your local farmers. And the Rural Health Network has been great um, that I've worked with them and the health departments and Cornell Cooperative Extension, very supportive. And I'm going to wrap it up. I think I'm running low on time, right? I'm gonna wrap it up with just a few pretty pictures. Um, and you, as you can see, sustainability, it's about diversity, it's about, you know, and from our point of farming, you know, healthy soil equals healthy plants equals healthy people. It's all connected. So, um, anyway, some pictures of cabbage and broccoli, uh, onions, and you can tell just with your eyes, you know, that things are thriving, you know, and that's one of the key ways we tell if everything's in balance is just look at it, look at it closely and carefully. Uh, onions, potatoes, just breaking into blossom there. Tomatoes, some nice summer squash, very productive, zucchini, and garlic, which a little bit weedy in this picture, but shows how much garlic you can grow in a small space. We grow about 6,000 garlic in uh, a couple beds wide. Great picture. We were like yelling, run for the camera. <laughs> The uh, rainbow just came out just perfectly. Actually, the colors aren't showing that great in, up on the slide thing, but you, know, you can see the horse pe peeking around the corner there. And bringing in the garlic harvest, um, some tomatoes, and one of the other things with organic systems is learn to accept your limitations, and uh, I'm trying to learn not to freak so much about everything. You can see a few spots on the leaves there. Septoria leaf spot and early blight, and living in the Northeast, it's a fact you're gonna get them, especially if you don't spray. Uh, beets, beautiful red cabbage, love that picture. Watermelons, our new garden, we've been at this garden, this will be our sixth year at this garden and it loves melons. I mean, this whole bed, you can see the four of them together, the whole bed was covered with melons like that. 
green beans. We uh, plant green beans every two weeks, have a constant supply, and uh, each row is 200 feet long, three to four beds, three to four rows per planting, depending on which markets they're for. I'll have to be handpicked. <laughs> Some pretty flowers, snapdragons, and uh, a few pictures. One of the nice things for sustainable farms is, you know, trying to hedge your bets. And we picked this farm deliberately because it's a nice creek flat with very few stones. And as you can see him tilling here, there's, what don't you see is rocks. <laughs> Starting off with good soil. Good picture, we started a couple of years ago uh, bringing a you know, draft horse in and we're training her and we used her all day yesterday, well, all morning yesterday anyway, dragging after we plowed. My daughter Claire with her pony, and there's her after the horse show. And my daughter Rosemary is over at the table with one of the lambs. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much. And uh, I'll be available afterwards for the comments. I'm looking forward to it. I'm Casey Telfer. I am the new director of programs and services at the Food Bank of the Southern Tier. And I wanted to start out quickly just talking about the difference between a food bank and a food pantry, because um, we get a lot of confusion about that. Most people are familiar with the idea of a food pantry. Um, it's a community-based, often located in a church or another public building where individuals and families can go if they're having trouble meeting their food needs, if they need a little help making ends meet, you go and you pick up about three days' worth of food. The food bank is a warehouse full of food. Um, the food bank of the southern tier is located in Elmira. We have a warehouse we move about, um, in 2008 we moved about 6.8 million pounds of food. We cover six counties, um, Broome, Tioga, Tompkins, uh, Steben, Chemung, and Schuyler counties. So throughout those six counties we have about 185 member agencies in our network. So those are the food pantries, the soup kitchens, the shelters, we have some residences, um, senior feeding programs, things like that. And we distribute the food to those agencies who then in turn give it to the individuals in need. Um, in, uh, we've been, we were founded in 1981, so we've been serving this area um, for about 28 years now. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> the food that we distribute comes from a variety of sources. About 59% of it is donated to us through local farmers, local food drives, producers, and also national donations like Kraft donates a lot of foods, things like that. We're a member of an organization called Feeding America, which is the nation's network of food banks, and they coordinate a lot of national level donations. Um, we get about 15% of our food from the USDA Commodities Distribution Program, which is called the Emergency Food Assistance Program. Um, that's sort of what, what people used to think of as the government cheese. It's a much more comprehensive program now, and we get a lot of food from that source. And the rest of the food that we get is through wholesale purchase. So we're able to leverage the amount of food that we need to buy into discounts, and then we can pass those discounts on to the agencies that need to distribute that food. Um, so we have a diverse source of food, and we get it out. We filled about 1.2 million requests for food in 2008. So um, that's not unduplicated numbers, but that's the number of times people came to our network of member agencies and said, we need assistance with food. Uh, about 322,000 of those requests came from Broome County um, in 2008. So that's sort of the food distribution side of the food bank. And then we also have some direct service programs. We have a position called the Nutrition Outreach and Education Program Coordinator. And she goes around to food pantries, to the HEAP office, to places that she can find individuals who might be food insecure. And she works with them to sort of pre-screen them to find out if they're eligible for the food stamps program and help them get on that. It takes her about two minutes to pre-screen um, an individual to find out if they're eligible, as opposed to going to the social services office, going through all of the paperwork, which is very time intensive, labor intensive, can be a huge hassle. Um, that program is a phenomenal success. Uh, I, I believe the NOAP that works for us enrolled about 195 households into the food stamps program last year. She's located in Chemung County. It brought about $465,000 worth of federal funds into Chemung County last year. There is one in Broome County. She works for the Family Enrichment Network. Her work um, enrolled, I want to say almost 400 new households in the food stamps program last year. It brought in about $750,000 in federal funds to this area. So that's, that's an economically very viable program. It's a fantastic program. 
Um, we also have a mobile food pantry. It's a converted beverage truck. We use it to go to rural and underserved areas to get fresh produce and dairy products out to individuals who are in need. Um, you might see it in Binghamton. It comes to Binghamton about once a month. We consider this an underserved area because of the level of poverty in this area and the pounds per person in poverty that the food bank distributes in this area. So you'll see it in downtown Binghamton about once a month. We distributed about two million pounds of food that way last year. Another one of our big programs is called the Backpack Program. We work with schools, um, with the food service directors and with teachers to identify students who are in food insecure households. We deliver food to the, to the schools and then on Friday afternoons the teachers put bags of food in the backpacks of the children who are in need of food over the weekend so that they have access to nutritional food over the weekend. Um, we're in about 18 school districts throughout our six counties and our goal is to eventually be in every school district in our six counties. So um, that has been going well. We also do a lot of education. We have um, a youth education program where we teach students about the difference between buying local and buying national and what that looks like in terms of the nutritional content of food, in terms of the um, economy, the effects on the economy, um, about the different aspects of what makes a, a community or an individual food insecure. And we do that with children and with adults. Um, and then we have the food bank garden. We have a teaching garden at our facility in Elmira, and then we also have the Plan a Row for a Hungry program. In 2008, the Plan a Row program bought in about 6,300 pounds of produce for um, families in need in this area. So that's been a great program. And we've seen a lot more interest in the gardening aspect of the food bank, I would say, in the past, in the past year, in the past several months, that's sort of been coming up as the whole idea of Victory Gardens and getting back to really um, sort of that grassroots food security movement. We've been seeing a lot of that. Um, so one of the things that Amelia asked me to touch on was sort of, from our perspective, what is hunger versus what is food insecurity and how does that all tie into community food security? And I would say that um, hunger really, it's a, you'll get a variety of different answers in terms of what is hunger. Some organizations simply use hunger as that feeling that you get when you don't eat enough. So. You eat breakfast in the morning, by noon, you're hungry. It's a physical feeling. That's not generally um, the definition that we use when we're talking about the hungry in America, the hungry that the food bank member agencies serve. Um, the, I, w I would say that the definition that we kind of use for hunger is the recurrent and involuntary lack of access to sufficient food due to poverty or a lack of resources. So this isn't fasting for religious purposes or cleansing or any of that. It's because you simply can't afford enough food. Um, food security obviously is tied to hunger. And um, I would say individual or family food security, and I'm going to read it so that I don't um, get any of it wrong. It's the assured access at all times to enough food for an active, healthy lifestyle with no need for recourse to emergency food sources or other extraordinary coping behaviors to meet basic food needs. That definition um, specifically excludes a lot of the food bank's programs from the idea of food security. The food bank is more, in a lot of ways, um, part of the safety net for individuals who don't have food security. If you are a household who does not have access on a regular basis to enough food to meet your basic needs, then we have this network of agencies that we work with that can get you food to kind of get you through. You're going to get about three days worth of food, so it's certainly not an ongoing, regular part of your food plan for your family or your household. Um, but it is part of the network that can be there in those cases, you know, situational poverty, um, that that, that kind of comes up for most people at some point. Um, community food security, and again, the definitions of each of these will change depending on what organization you're talking to or the context that you're using. Um, but the definition that I like the best of food, community food security that I've come across so far is um, from the Community Food Security Coalition, which is a national organization. And the definition that they use is, um, community food security is a condition in which all community residents obtain a safe, culturally acceptable, nutritionally adequate diet through a sustainable food system that maximizes community self-reliance and social justice. So it's kind of a mouthful, um, but there's a reason that I really like that definition. 
and it's that it touches on a lot of basic principles that I think can be kind of missed if you're looking just at food. Obviously, um, a stable agricultural base is the key to any kind of community food security. Um, you know, you have to have viable, um, you know, profitable farms. You, the food has to come from somewhere. So that's obviously sort of the basis of a community that is food secure. But this definition also kind of touches on a lot of the other issues that are involved in community, serve, uh, community food security. Um, one of the things that they talk about is the food needs of low-income individuals, which is sort of the, the focus of what the food bank does, of what our member agencies do. That's sort of what we look at when we're looking at can a, food, can a community be um, food secure. If the members of your community which are not, which don't have the resources, you know, you can have a grocery store in the right place, you can have a, a viable farm, you can have fantastic transportation, but if those individuals who don't have access to the resources to get that food, if they don't have the money to buy it, then you don't have a, a food secure community. You have a mostly food secure community perhaps, but if those individuals don't have access to that, then, then really you probably don't have a food secure community. And that's one of the things that the food bank really focuses on. Um, but one of the other things that they talk about in this, um, in this definition is that you have to take into, it's interdisciplinary, you have to take into account that, you know, the farms need support, you need um, access to labor, as Lisa said, they have to have access to labor, they have to have access to the markets, but they also need, you know, planning protection, they need protection from urban sprawl, from environmental degradation, from the disintegration of the rural communities. So those are all things that really need to be considered when you're looking at a whole food secure community. Um, and this definition really has sort of a community focus. It's what's food secure for one community might not mean food security for another community. Food secure in New York City is going to look different than food security in some of the very rural areas of Broome County. You might have access issues in one area and you might have land issues in another area. So really looking at what your specific community needs I think is an important part of, of community food security. So sort of where the um, food bank is seeing things going, the trends that we're seeing are definitely lower food security across the board. Um, from 2007 to 2008, we saw an increase in the number of households served by our network. Um, we saw a 28% increase in the number of households using emergency food programs from 2007 to 2008. We saw a 42% increase in the number of seniors being served through these programs from 2007 to 2008. We're now getting our first quarter statistics from 2008 to 2009, and we're still seeing an increase. I think. They haven't, been, they haven't been officially confirmed or anything yet, but from what I can see, there's about a 10% increase from, 2000, um, from 2008 to 2009 for the first quarter. So definitely the trends are people are using more community food uh, programs, emergency feeding programs. Um, in Broome County, 62% of the people served through our emergency feeding program partners were children. So that's a huge concern in terms of nutrition, in terms of development and education, and sort of that cycle of poverty, is that we've really got to be looking at, are the children food secure? Um, the food bank's role in food security, as I said, some of the definitions specifically exclude a lot of our programs from what we would consider community food security. But there are ways that we do add to that community food security. As I said, the, the food stamps program is sort of considered the first line of defense against hunger, against food insecurity, and we do work with families to get them enrolled in that. We work with a lot of the federal nutrition programs, and I'm sure Ray is going to talk about sort of the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Act is coming up this year. We do some advocacy around that. Um, but one of the things that we do that I think is not really essential to the mission of the food bank, but is really one of the things that we can do, is the food bank buys a lot of food. As I said, you know, um, we get 59% donated, 15% from the federal government, and the rest of it we buy. And so we're really starting to look at can we buy things locally, and what can we get locally, and is it, does it fit in with what we're trying to do, and if it, if it can and it supports the community, then that's what we're really trying to do. Um, and I don't, I don't actually have the, the amount of food that we spend, or the amount of money that we spend on food every year, but I know, for example, last year we spent $35,000 on eggs. And those were New York State eggs, and that's not a huge amount of money, but for one family farm, it's a good chunk. Um, so if we can 
sort of focus our resources onto buying New York State food, then that's definitely something that the food bank is very interested in. Um, let's see. I'm um, I think that, you know, reducing the gap between, one of the questions that Amelia had posed was how can we reduce the gap between producers and consumers? Um, and I think it's really just about looking at community food security as a, an interdisciplinary, multiple layer problem. It's not, the issue is not that there's not enough food in the U.S. You know, we produce twice as much food as we need in the world. It, the issue is more, it, it's broader than that. It's transportation, it's lack of access, it's lack of income, it's planning for supporting the farmers and things like that. Um, so those are all the kinds of things that we're trying to incorporate um, as well as our core mission of simply giving out food and being that safety net. Um, so, I don't know, I guess that's kind of I think I'm out of time. <laughs> so. The more I've worked with food systems in my 25 years in schools and restaurants before, uh, I think that I find the food system is, is amazingly complex. Uh, there's an awful lot of issues that we have to look at in, in, our, in our social system and, and how the whole food system works. And I really wasn't until about 10 or, you know, 10, 12 years ago that I got involved looking at sustainability um, and really started to have concern for the food system because as of many people that were in my position or in my position that are buyers or whatever, food, you called the number, you ordered the food, it came to your place and you were done. You paid the person. And it really took a whole lot of education, a whole lot of building relationships and getting to understand what a gift food is and to understand every group I talked to that only 2% of Americans farm, that it really became an issue that really concerned me. It not only became an issue then, but there was a quality of foods. Being in, a, in a institutions where I get the privilege and still do somewhat feeding children and seeing what's happened in our system and seeing what's happened to the health of our children and seeing what they're talking about, the obesity problems with four-year-olds, looking at the diabetes, it really has kind of slapped us in the face to say, what the hell are you doing? What are you doing with this gift you had? How are you processing it? And what are you giving to the kids? And it has become to the forefront. It takes communication and it takes relationships to address all these issues, much as the folks on the panel who I can't say I know every one of them because we've all worked together and that's really what it takes. It takes relationship and it takes the total community to make change and take another look at our food system and what are our priorities? What are our priorities as human beings? And what are our priorities of Mother Earth? What are our priorities where we want to see this go? It's wonderful that you guys are having these discussions today and certainly want to keep those going and be part of them throughout. A little bit with the school and what we're doing. Um, the Farm School Project, again, is about eight years old in New York State, grassroots effort. Just a bunch of volunteers that kind of got together and said, we want to see what we can do to get more nutritious products, local products, into our schools. Cliff mentioned the procurement. We have a lot of laws on the books for everything we can do, how we can buy, what those regulations are, what's permitted, what's not permitted. Just recently, uh, we had some glimmer of hope when the USDA came out and said, you can process, you can purchase products locally that are minimum processed, and they identified some. In September, they came out and we found out they changed the law, and they said, well, minimally processed no longer in includes things like carrots or apple slices. Well, we had a farmer or two in New York State, Champlain Valley area, that have taken a risk, have bought an equipment, have gone back to growing carrots, have started giving us products, and we found out now, without bidding, we could not get these products from this farmer or the processor. Sadly enough, um, this farmer had an awful lot of money, he does have a lot of money in this equipment. When we went to the Community Food Coalition Group, that was spoke about earlier, and they went down and we did some lobbying. Also, uh, Senator Albertine and Gillibrand did join with us and did go to USDA, and we we're trying to get this law changed. But they said for everyone who was representing the farmers, 
there was at least 10 lobbyists from the food industry in the room fighting for it. It really comes down to dollars. So we're going to have to face as the whole food system does come down to dollars. And a lot of it is big business against little guys. And it's going to be a tough fight. But I think, again, I think we're going to get there and I think it's going to work because it is the right thing to do. Okay, farm to school in New York State. We didn't have a home, but now we are adopted under the New York State Department of Agriculture. Uh, we are a standing program for that committee. I co-chair that committee, and it has a lot of folks on from health to education to Farm Bureau, uh, Task Force Farm Food and Nutrition. We have a lot of representatives, probably 25 to 30 people on. And our endeavor is no longer even farm to school, it's farm to institution. It's farm to daycare, it's farm to hospital, it's farm to college, it's farm to elderly housing. It doesn't matter because we know that all the audience needs these products that we're trying to get out. So it really has grown. Um, we are just talking about the food banks. The food banks are on our committee now. It used to be farm to school because as Tefis was talking about, when the food banks aren't getting that food, they want to get local. And if we can get local product going for the schools, for the institutions, for the food banks and be able to process those products, then we can have a product right here that's gonna strengthen agriculture, keep the money in the state, and we know it's gonna be wholesome and we'll know it's gonna be safe. It's gonna be right here. I'd much rather walk on a farm and see the products, which I've been able to do, and even Lisa bailed me out last September. When I called her at 7.30 in the morning, didn't have some local lettuce, and she was the end of the year, but she managed to get it for us. Um, it, you know the people, you know them by face, you're able to walk on it. I know I'm taking safe product into the school. I don't always know that on the open market. I am one of the folks that had to bury ground beef last year. 20 cases, 40 pounds cases went into the ground buried because of a possible E. coli contamination. I want more control on that food. By the way, I did get a check for that food. It was for $34. So that means we had to go out and spend that extra money to make up for that, but that was a settlement with, with the government. School programs, very quickly, I just want to point out, in case you don't know, are financially independent of the, of the general fund. We do not get money from the general fund to feed the kids. What the kids pay is that $2 or whatever they pay, pays the labor, pays for the food, pays for the equipment, pays for the dishwasher, pays for everything, or else you don't have a job. So that's pretty much a little pressure you're on. The rest of the money we get from state and federal government. New York State in 21 years has not increased the money they give to child nutrition programs in the schools. Last year, the governor took 8% of that money away. At the same time, they're telling us buy fresh fruits, vegetables, high grain products, low grain, and it's very hard to do. We actually have about a dollar to provide a meal for a child. So we need to work with industry, we need to work with, with local, and we need to find these foods and make these foods available for our kids. One of the things we do have is Farm Fest to you, the poster that's in front of me and there are farm to school brochures over here, please take. But last year we changed this, this was a, uh, through the Assembly Farm Food, Task Force on Farm Food and Nutrition, was a week that they tried to get going for years until we finally were able to take it over. It's now going to be the Farm Fest to you by the year. Every year it's going to change. This year we're identifying New York State products. We're going to have cards for the kids to give out. We got a little money, pin money to spend this year. What I ask you to do is just contact your schools and it's going to be October uh, 5th to the 9th this year and just ask if they're participating in this program. They can have the posters, they can have the cards from Agri Markets Free. There's nothing they have to do except if they want to give for the first time a New York apple, that's wonderful. If they can do more than that, they want to bring a farmer in, there's a corn roasting, we have contests, we have statewide contests, that's great too. But it is going to take a lot of awareness. The whole system is going to be need change. It's happening locally. I also just want to make you aware of the um, regional community food project that is in Broome County, kind of representing all the outlining counties as well. We are pretty much grassroots. We are looking for a grant right now through USDA along with uh, Ag and Markets. And this one is to look at the infrastructure of how do we develop these products, how do we deliver it, how do we give an equitable wage and cost to the farmer, how do we get it to the school or the institution? Because there are a lot of roadblocks that have to be taken care of. We're really, really hopeful that this is gonna come through. It'll be a three-year study. Uh, we certainly would welcome everybody to participate because we need input, and we're really banking on this one. We've got shot down a couple times before, but we're gonna keep trying. 
the ag and markets really wants to see this as a program that we can come up with these answers and then they want to replicate it throughout the state. So there is a lot of interest, there is a lot of support, and it can happen. The other thing I've got to say is for the kids we serve, and this may be a little redundant, but there are many kids that I serve who do not have access to these foods. There are many of these kids that live in neighborhoods in the urban deserts, as we call them, as you well know, that do not have access to healthy foods and they're not in the stores. People are struggling with their food dollars and they're going down in quality. It's much cheaper and I've seen a home where they bought a two liter Coca-Cola bottle because it was 88 cents and the milk was too expensive for the kids. I understood the financial aspect of that, but nutritionally they need some help. The backpack program that was spoke about has been very important for our kids. Um, we don't talk about the schools that have the backpack program. We don't want to embarrass the children that have to use it. But we do not have access to food for emergency situations in Broome County on weekends. There are, are no soup kitchens um, open on weekends. So this has really helped us in making sure we got foods into those kids. And so that Monday morning when those kids come back, we don't now hear, you know, it's a backpack day. Uh, hopefully it gets them through a few days. The other thing we're trying is fresh fruits and vegetables in that program um, to get that to the kids. There are some federal programs now, fresh fruits and vegetables, three-year program um, that schools can apply for this year. 50% or more kids have to be free or reduced to apply for the program. Uh, we did it at JC this year. It's amazingly successful. And they're actually giving us enough money to buy fresh fruits and vegetables for kids. Um, and, and the kids and the teachers have said what a difference it's made in the ability to teach and for the child to compete and learn. And if there's anything we should be doing in child nutrition is giving what kids need to compete and to learn and to grow. I mean, then when we have them at five years old, all that development, cognitive development, all the tissue growth and muscle growth, and we don't give the kids the right nutrients, what are we doing? So I think it's really time to even start looking at farm to school, child nutrition, the safety of our food, the quality of our food, the responsibility of the foods we have that we can give our kids, our audiences, whether it's children, underserved areas, adults, it really doesn't matter. But the more knowledge we have, it is gonna be harder work. It is gonna take more for us to make it work, but it certainly is the right thing to do. Thank you. Fruits and vegetables for the children. Could you say a little more about the outcome? That is, the, the teacher reports that things work better, the kids are more placid. Uh, what, what, what are the measures? Yeah, the, actually, the, the um, kids used to bring in their own snacks from home. And the teacher said, that obviously, they were not wholesome snacks. They said when the kids, they, they, we take them right up to the classroom, deliver it to the classroom. The kids come back from their other activities, have the snack. And they said when it was, because our school is so big, I don't want to take a lot of time with this, but these kids eat at quarter after seven in the morning. They don't have lunch till one o'clock. And they said by, by 12, 11 30, one o'clock, they were losing the kids. They said that it's much easier to teach them now. They're more attentive and they're consuming the product. The one thing about the program too <coughs> is we ask adults also to consume the product because we want them to model the behavior. And that's what we're seeing. And the principal is also south. So we're, at JC at least, we are going to try to expand the program for another grade level. Okay. Amongst you people up there, do you have any more ideas than perhaps we've been able to come up with of how we can connect uh, people who are food scarce with the ability to actually grow food? I mean, we know that there's land in the county. It's like, like a lot of things, it's a, a partly a question of will, but there's acres in Conklin that can be cultivated. Now, how does that land get cultivated in such a way that the people actually get the food? And there's a whole lot of complications, of course. Generally, people that are poor don't know how to grow food, can't get to the gardens, et cetera, et cetera. But if the political will is there, Maybe we can figure out some way to create a context in which these people can actually help themselves instead of going to the food bank and saying, I'm hungry. Uh, they could go to the garden and grow food. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's one of these great ideas, but how in hell do you actually do it, is what I'm saying. 
I, I can speak at least on behalf of the, the schools. Um, Cornell has some great ag in the classroom curriculum, also with gardening. We are looking at doing some gardening at JC with the kids using senior citizens that are living real close to the school now for kind of intergeneration, intergenerational project. I know um, Walton schools, and they're just getting off the ground now, are doing kind of a learning lab or want to develop a learning lab garden directly across from their school that will actually have some stipend money to teach the kids some agriculture skills and give them some money for doing it. Um, I also know that the, they're the um, Southern Tier, Binghamton, is looking at transportation for getting folks from lower income neighborhoods to the farmers markets. At least at Ostenango at this time, I understand they'll be piloting that. So I think there are some efforts that are actually starting. And yeah, it's the same thing, you know, give a fish uh, type of thing. We would like the kids, I mean, if they go back with tomato products in some of the places they live, but at least they're able to grow those in their apartments or wherever they happen to live and have that one skill and just build on that. I think there's an awful lot you can do with that. I, I think it's an inner urban gardening, absolutely. Uh, but how do we get and how do we make all that work? It does take a, a lot of footwork. So, you please see it. Thanks. Um, I think one of the other components needs to be, you know, some sort of cooking classes. I mean, a lot of the people you're trying to help don't eat that kind of food they're not familiar with it that they don't cook from scratch those kinds of foods you know they go for the cheap easy convenience foods so you know some sort of um, you know outreach in terms of cooking skills needs to be done as well um, I would say too the food bank has uh, the ability to come to the schools and go to the the communities and help learn we have a couple of the master gardeners um, through the cooperative extension are you through the Cooperative Extension Program, they have a Master Gardener Program, and I know two of our staff are going to be Master Gardeners, and then we have access to them. So we do work with organizations like Cornell Cooperative Extension who can teach those things. And then we also, um, we do work in our, in, in our network pantries. We work with Just Say Yes to Fruits and Vegetables, which is a statewide program that goes around and teaches people. They'll find out what they're giving away in the pantry that week, and they'll bring recipes, and they'll actually show people how to prepare that food. Cornell Cooperative Extension has a very similar program where they can show people how to use food they can show people how to stretch their food dollars and they do a lot of work with teaching you know getting together with new farmers and part-time farmers um, and providing support and resources and things so I think it's a lot of again I mean it's working together with the different organizations that are in the community to make sure that everyone's you know on the same page and working together I want to add one last thing just to echo something that Gay Nicholson said last night it's also about relationships it's about building relationships with our neighbors with the people that we go to church with um, to other parents that we know from you know the, our kids play part our kids uh, friends um, and getting people to become comfortable with this idea of taking control over their food source growing food when you know I know a lot of people that come to me on a regular basis and ask me how do I start a garden they, they don't know they want to but they don't know how so they need someone in their life who can help to start guide them whether it's cooperative extension or a friend or a coworker. so a lot of times even friends you know just two days ago my daughter had a friend over and we made lemon we said you know do you want lemonade and so they sent the kids to the store to get lemons and she had never had fresh squeezed lemonade before which just astonished me and uh, <laughs> you know she'd always made it from a mix you know and um, the so it, friends can be very you know instrumental in exposing others to new ideas and also I do a lot of farm tours because I live maybe 20 houses from the Appala Appalachian Elementary School so I have for many years now, walk the kids through the woods, second and fourth grade, uh, the, tra the trails behind the school end up in our field. So we bring the kids over and I set up a bunch of different stations and I have the children do anything from carting wool to digging carrots. And digging carrots is the perennial favorite activity. And I had a mother call me at home that night and say my child has never eaten a carrot before. But be I let them all take a fistful of carrots home and uh, she, she said it was the first time this kid had ever eaten a carrot. They'd always rejected them because they were 
carrots, you know. But because this little boy had dug them himself, he was very excited, and she said he ate every single one of them. So that's, yeah, that kind of enthusiasm through this experience of actually some hands-on participation in harvesting, you know, really sparked this little kid's interest, and, in, you know, so hopefully he sticks with the carrot thing, but. I just want to um, let the gentleman who was asking about how do we get things going uh, know that here at BCC we are in the planning stages of getting some gardens going and um, it's going to be part just native plants for the beauty of the campus to bring more people on our campus but also uh, we're looking at community gardens and hooking in with people who are doing the same thing and, and being a part of a coalition and a cooperative uh, venture on the whole thing. So I am I'm more than willing to talk to people about what what we would like what we're kind of seeing might happen on this campus and the kinds of things from uh, an educational standpoint we could do. We have an early childhood education program that I know will be very interested in in learning how to teach kids about nutrition about the natural world so I mean that's just one of the many things that we think we can do so um, so I, I'm here I'll, I'll hook up just look for the redhead just a question about restaurants in the area is there any extension to them to create partnership to use locally grown food um, does anybody I, know yes I mean I do sell to several restaurants and a lot of my friends do as well there um, mostly successful in the smaller quirkier restaurants but uh you know chattawile cafe down on 434 in pennsylvania she's awesome she'll like i can go after the farmer's market and pull up with anything she's like i'll take it you know and she's very creative so she will change her menu according to what i have uh river rose cafe cellar restaurant um, a lot of these smaller restaurants are able to adapt their menus lost dog cafe has uh, worked with a friend of mine in the past uh copper cricket used to so yes they don't even necessarily advertise it unfortunately you know they are willing to work with us but don't necessarily promote it so much on their menus and um, just because it's a pain in the butt to draw up a new menu you know or cards for the tables or whatever you know so I understand that but they are very very supportive of uh, reaching out and connecting to the local consumer also Summerhouse Grill down in Montrose Pennsylvania I mean his whole menu is local seasonal you know the entire thing every from the drinks to the meats to the you know salads everything is local you all gave me an idea uh, I belong uh, to a CSA and uh, we give money at the beginning of the year to get it going now there are two things that we could do one in the CSA and another one outside we could give extra money to the CSA to help children. And if we can get a connection, for example, with Southern Tier, uh, to find out the names of families, uh, we can get that food to them. Another thing we can do is if we get neighborhoods of people growing a row, or two or three or four or five, uh, we can start um, a neighborhood exchange and that neighborhood exchange can also donate a certain percentage of their food uh, for children. Now, it's not perfect, but it's something that we can do. Yeah, um, could you say something about, oh, say something. Uh, say something about Chow and uh, what role they play in. Do they do uh, provide food on the weekends? You said there's no emergency meals. Uh, by the, some of the organizations you said, do they fill in the gap to an extent? Chow is actually one of the member agencies of the Food Bank of the Southern Tier, and we do get a lot of confusion about the relationship between Chow and the Food Bank of the Southern Tier. Um, and it's kind of a different type of, of member than most of our others, because it's sort of a redistribution organization. Um, some of the food that Chow distributes through their pantry program, they have about 26 pantries throughout um, Broome County, and some of the food that they distribute they get through the food bank, and some of it they get through community food drives. Um, I don't know that they run any actual meal programs. 
Um, they also do Broom Bounty, which is food rescue, which the food bank doesn't do any food rescue. Broom Bounty actually goes around to restaurants and picks up food that hasn't been served yet, that was prepared and not served, and then they take that to any nonprofit organization in Broome County who can use it. Um, and in terms of, there is actually, what's that? Yeah, we, we, we work with Chow to do the backpack program for Broome County as well. So we bring the food down and then we use the Chow warehouse so that we can connect with folks here and we work with Chow to get the backpacks out in Broome County as well. Um, and I do know there's actually one community meal on the weekends in Endicott. The, uh, there's a Buddhist meditation group that meets, I think, at the United Methodist Church in Endicott, and they actually do have a meal after their meditation on Saturday. So, but that is the only one that I know of on the weekends in Broome County. It seems like the effect of uh, national food subsidy programs affects food production and costs a whole lot more than anything else. I think fruits and vegetables are the most minimally subsidized food, and I wonder if you could speak to how the National Farm Subsidy Program affects food distribution and production. Okay, so th that's a question and a comment. Yes, the, the Agricultural Subsidy Program does does subsidize certain types of food. There are not really subsidies for, for fresh fruits and vegetables. The subsidy system promotes the production of grains, which in this country, most of our grains go into meat production. So there, there are people that have called for subsidies for fruit and vegetables, and other people that are just saying, just get rid of the subsidies for grains so that it can so that fruits and vegetables can be on par with the cost of overly processed foods made out of corn and wheat and soy. It's a very complex system. I hope that in, with the new administration we might see some changes, especially <coughs> since we do have a sustainable agriculture advocate being appointed as the deputy under sec uh, secretary for the USDA. So maybe we'll see some positive changes, but it's a complicated system. It it subsidizes unhealthy foods. Just as a follow-up, it typically is there's been some subsidies not only on grains but obviously the uh, milk and cheese products and some, for whatever reason, honey products. Uh, I never could quite figure out how some of them got on the list, but they're there. <laughs> and, uh, and it started, you know, well, I was supervisor of the town of Bainbridge back in the. Uh, 86 to 95 and that's when they started actually delivering some food to the town hall or we could des designate the local church and it was the, the food giveaway program and I was always quite amazed at some of the stuff that they brought in as quote uh, surplus but uh, y you know the milk program is is trying to balance supply and demand and right now we're seeing a, a dropping off of demand and and uh, increasing amount of supply and it takes a, a lot of time to change your dairy industry to match supply and demand. You know, we've been growing cow numbers for the last couple of years, and so the, right now the, the subsidy is, try, is starting to kick in to pay farmers for the difference. Otherwise, we'd have farmers falling off the face of the earth, earth because of the loss of uh, profit here. But, you know, some farmers say get the government out of it and let it be what it is and some farmers want to have some type of a cushion there. So there's, there's mixed emotions about the whole program. Uh, this question is specifically for Assemblyman Crouch. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to uh, how you imagine the potential development of the Marcellus uh, gas shale fields, the impact that it uh, could have on local food production and the risks that are involved in that, uh, and then how you would uh, intervene or how you want to interpret that. Uh, the, the development of the Marcellus Shale, in some cases, uh, you know, some of the drilling may not be in any, you know, productive acres. It depends on, I'm not sure exactly how they decide where they're going to put their wells. In some areas, it may be taking out some productive acres. Um, you know, the concerns that have been raised about, you know, whether it's going to be polluting the aquifers or what, what's going to happen with some of the material that they're bringing out of the wells, how that's going to be handled, uh, those are presently uh, uh, being discussed and decided uh, by DEC, I believe, and they're, they've done their, 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 they're developing their draft uh, GIS statement. So I have yet to see it as their final product, and, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see that soon and be able to have some hearings on it. 
and maybe make some comments on it in the near future. Thank you everyone for all the great questions and thank you to our panelists for having helping us have such a great session. Thank you.